Good afternoon, and welcome to this year's Founders Day at the University of Georgia. Today, we recognize this occasion not only to commemorate the founding of this great institution, but also to celebrate the birthplace of public higher education in America, which began with the signing of the UGA Charter by Abraham Baldwin and others 231 years ago in Savannah. Those founders established a firm foundation which has now grown, I'm pleased to see, into one of the very best public research universities in America. The University of Georgia, the flagship institution of this state, has 17 schools and colleges, a new health sciences campus, which also houses our medical partnership, and extended campuses in Tifton, Griffin, Gwinnett, Washington, D.C., Oxford, England, Cortona, Italy, and Costa Rica. We have extension and service learning operations in every county in this state. And after more than 200 years, I think we can all proudly say that the University of Georgia touches virtually every place in the world. This day is also a very special day because it gives us the opportunity to recognize individuals that have provided meritorious service to the University of Georgia. Earlier this afternoon, I was privileged to award the President's Medal to two outstanding individuals. This is an honor that's bestowed annually at Founders Day on individuals no longer employed at this institution, but individuals who have dedicated their lives to supporting students, championing the research enterprise, or support supporting public service and outreach. The first recipient of the President's Medal this year was Abbott Massey, who is a graduate of the University of Georgia and served as executive director of the Georgia Poultry Federation for 49 years and also as past president of the UGA Alumni Association. Abbott continues to serve on both our research and our real estate foundations. And the second recipient uh, is the late Jane Wilson. Jane was one of the university's most generous benefactors who left her mark on this institution in many, many ways and in many places. Although she passed away at the age of 92 in November, her impact, along with her late husband, Harry's, will live on at the University of Georgia for many, many years to come. Please join me in thanking these two extraordinary individuals. I'm glad that all of you have come to today's lecture. I know you will enjoy today's program, and I hope you'll all join me in saying happy birthday to the University of Georgia. Thanks for being here. Welcome to the 14th Annual Founders Day Lecture, presented by the UGA Alumni Association and the Emeriti Scholars. I am Meredith Gurley Johnson, Executive Director of the UGA Alumni Association, I'm so glad that you've chosen to join us as we celebrate 231 years since the UGA Charter was signed, thus establishing the country's first state chartered institution of higher education. Before we continue, I'd like you to join me in thanking the pre-lecture entertainment, the Taylor Rich Trio and Christopher Sapp for the alma mater. Today, we gather to celebrate a milestone anniversary for the University of Georgia and reflect on Abraham Baldwin's role in the birth of public higher education. Baldwin believed that higher education was deserved by everyone, not just those who could afford it. He believed it was a public commodity that would do the most good if it were made accessible to the general public. 
When the charter was signed on January 27, 1785, it was not only the creation of America's first state institution of learning, but it also prompted other states to follow it. Nearly 15 years ago, the UGA Alumni Association sought to recognize this day with an event that reflected the traditions upon which UGA was established. In collaboration with the Emeriti Scholars, we hosted the first Founders Day Lecture in 2002. And today, we're proud that this lecture is a part of the university's prestigious signature lecture series. At this time, I would like to recognize the Emeriti Scholars, a group of esteemed faculty members who continue to serve the university. I invite them to stand so we may thank them for their ongoing commitment to public higher education. Students have always been at the center of the University of Georgia's mission, and therefore it is only fitting that they play a role in this milestone occasion. I would like to invite Lydia O'Brien, president of the Student Alumni Council, to the stage to introduce our keynote speaker. Lydia? Good afternoon. I am Liddy O'Brien, a senior from Cumming, Georgia, studying international affairs and anthropology. I am honored to be a part of today's celebration and to introduce today's speaker, Thomas C. Reeves, Professor Emeritus of Learning, Design, and Technology. Dr. Reeves arrived at UGA in 1982 and retired in 2010. Prior to that, he held positions at the Medical University of South Carolina and the University of Maryland University College. He was a Fulbright lecturer in Peru, and he has been invited to speak across, across the country and in over 30 countries. Dr. Reeves has written several books, including Interactive Learning Systems Evaluation, A Guide to Authentic E-Learning, and Conducting Educational Design Research. In 1995, Multimedia Producer Magazine named him one of the top 100 people in multimedia. And in 2003, he earned the Fellowship Award from the Association for the Advancement of Computing in Education. Two years ago, he received the Lifetime Award from the International Association for Development of the Information Society. Today, Dr. Reeves is a consultant for the World Health Organization on the development of authentic task-based e-learning for public health personnel involved in pharmaceutical cold chain management. He often serves as an external evaluator for funded research and other institutions' development projects. Dr. Reeves is on the College of Education's Board of Visitors and resides here in Athens with his wife, Dr. Trisha Reeves, a UGA professor of social work. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Thomas C. Reeves to the stage. Just have to get my technology ready here for a second, and I guess we're gonna bring the uh, screens down, and it looks like everything's working well. Um, it's always a risk when you use technology, but I think that it'll be beneficial. Hopefully you can see those slides okay. Um, thank you for that generous introduction. I really appreciate it. I could spend my entire time thanking all the people in this room. There's so many wonderful people here that have influenced me. But I do want to single out a few uh, for special gratitude. Professor Emeritus Ron Simpson and all of the Emeritus faculty Thank you for putting your faith in me to give this lecture, and I hope I live up to your expectations. I'd like to especially single out Professor Emeritus Sylvia Hutchinson. Sylvia, you have been a mentor to me, to so many people, my wife, Tricia. Uh, you are a treasure on this campus, and I just want to thank you. I want to thank the good folks in the Office of, Al of Alumni Relations uh, for the university and also their equivalents in the College of Education. I see lots of College of Education people here, including our Dean Kennedy, and I certainly appreciate that support. Brian Heredia is the undergraduate uh, 
major, uh, uh, education major. He's getting a dual degree in history and uh, social studies education. I selected him for many reasons, but I used to be an old uh, social studies teacher, so I really wanted to uh, find someone, and, and he's just perfect. And Brian, I know in your remarks, you're going to be singling out one of your professors in the College of Education for special gratitude. And I want to begin by doing that as well. Here in the audience today is Professor Emeritus Skip Atkinson from Georgia State University and his lovely wife Vicki are here. They drove over from Atlanta. Skip, thank you for the past 43 years. You've been my mentor and my teacher, and I simply wouldn't be standing here today without you. Thank you. Finally, I want to thank my lovely wife, Professor Tricia Reeves from the School of Social Work here at the University of Georgia, and my son, Jamie. Jamie is a uh, graduate of the Masters of Public Health program here at the University of Georgia. The two of you give my life meaning and purpose. Uh, now, <clears throat> throughout, as uh, President Moorhead said, we're celebrating a very important event, 231 years since the chartering of this great university. Our official mission is to teach, to serve, and to inquire into the nature of things. And today, most of my remarks will be focused on the last part of that mission, to inquire into the nature of things, or what we call research. Specifically, I want to talk about research on learning. And of course, research on learning has a lot of implications for how we teach. Now, the title of my lecture is, So You Think You're Smarter Than a Robot, Winning the Race Between Human Learning and Machine Learning. If you aren't aware, uh, advances in machine learning are growing so fast, and they're making amazing progress in many sectors, but one of the outcomes of this is that they're eliminating huge swaths of jobs and currently valid careers. Um, now, many of you hold advanced degrees in various areas, and you're uh, bona fide experts in some field or another, and you might be sitting there and think, well, there's no way an algorithm or a robot's going to replace me. Well, maybe by the end of this session, you won't be so sure. So, now, uh, this actually is a, a robotic receptionist uh, at was developed at Nanyang Technological University. This is Nadine, and according to her developers, Nadine can uh, welcome people. She recognizes people she's met before and carry on conversations. She remembers what they said before. She can even express happiness or sadness based on their responses to her. These. Uh, some of these machine learning algorithms are instantiated in robots like Nadine, and they're getting so realistic, it's uncanny. Maybe at this point it might be good just to look from side to side and <laughs> see if you, know, you hear any soft whirling sounds coming from anyone. Uh, <clears throat> now, oh my goodness, how did this slide get in there? That's, that's Button and Zipper. Those are our Westies, and they actually must have stuck the slide in there because they're very concerned that we're going to replace them with a robotic dog. But I, they sat under my desk as I prepared this presentation, and I promised them that I would not ever think about doing that. So I think that these rapid advances in machine learning, deep learning, have major implications for how we teach and learn here at the university. I first became interested in this topic 20 years ago when I read this book by American economist Jerry Rifkin. It was called The End of Work. And Rifkin predicted that within a, no, a, a sh relatively short period of time, automation and, and uh, artificial intelligence programs would begin to eliminate lots of jobs, particularly he thought in the retail sector uh, and uh, the service sector. And he said that this would result in a, a limiting of the middle class and also in the uh, development of greater gap between haves and have-nots. Uh, some of that, unfortunately, has come true. Now, uh, Rifkin was ridiculed for his book 20 years ago, and people accused him of being a Luddite and uh, expressing the Luddite fallacy that when you eliminate jobs with technology, uh, you know, we should not have technology. Uh, but other people said, you know, instead of 
uh, eliminating jobs, we would have creative destruction. And what that means is that when technology uh, eliminates some jobs, that new jobs are created in other industries. <clears throat> well, today, these are recent covers from magazines like Nature and Science, uh, uh, The Economist and Wired Magazine, and uh, books are c all expressing this idea that these major advances that have been made over the last 20 years really do threaten uh, uh, many, many jobs, not just in the retail sectors and service sectors, but also in the professions. Uh, and that they spell the inevitable end of work as we know it. Now, the University of Georgia, throughout its illustrious history, has worked to prepare the most productive citizens for the state of Georgia and for our nation and the world. But lately, there's been an increasing focus on preparing people for specific careers. And there's a lot of debate about the benefits of that. We won't go into that. But I'd like you to think about asking some hard questions. Um, if you're a professor, perhaps you could ask this question. How can I better prepare my students to live in a world where many of them as adults may not ever have a career or a job in a traditional sense because of the nor enormous advances being made in deep learning by computers? If you're a student, and I know my wife has her class here, um, you know, what will I do when computer algorithms, robots, and other applications of AI eliminate entire swaths of currently viable careers, including my own? Do I want to scare you? No. But I do hope to stimulate more interest in what I see as a race between human learning and deep learning. Um, now, what you see here is I actually got involved in learning research 50 years ago this year. This is a story from the LaGrange Daily News, published when I was a senior at Troop County High School. And um, you see me in the center. I'm placing a white rat in a rocket. And um, <laughs> the story, let me read just a little bit of the story. It says, Tommy Reeves, as I was known at the time, Tommy Reeves and Doug Moat are involved in the study of the effects of rocket flight on the learning capabilities of white rats. On March 7, 1966, they launched a trained rat in a three-stage rocket powered by three factory-built fuel rocket engines. The rocket traveled at an average speed of 150 miles per hour and reached an altitude of over 2,000 feet. The rat was physically unharmed, and the, but the full mental effect has not been determined. <laughs> The last line of the story is a bit scary. It reads, these boys are now collaborating on the development of their own fuels. <laughs> Thankfully, we did not blow ourselves or the school up. Later that same spring, I visited Athens, Georgia for the first time in this beautiful campus. That was what the Coliseum looked then in 1966. It was only a couple years old, and to me it looked very futuristic. We came here for the state science fair. And my uh, physics teacher, Mr. James E. Brown, uh, not that James Brown, but he was a UGA graduate, and he was just thrilled to bring us here to see his university. Frankly, the university impressed me, but I was more impressed by eating at the varsity for the first time. <laughs> uh, it never crossed my mind that I would become a teacher or a professor or that I would spend the bulk of my career here but it was a wonderful experience. When I graduated from high school, I did not have any money for college. And uh, frankly, I really didn't even know there were things like scholarships. So instead, I went into the Army. Uh, I entered the Army, and I want to make sure you understand that I was not an Army Ranger, as this picture might suggest. Um, I actually was trained to be a chaplain's assistant. And as part of my training, I was sent to a one-week audiovisual school in New York, uh, where I learned how to thread a 16 millimeter projector in 9.5 seconds while I was blindfolded. Uh, so it was, it was interesting that I got introduced to that uh, whole area when I was in the Army. When I came out of the Army, I began my career, uh, 
uh, university education in earnest. And over the next eight years, I earned two degrees at George State University. And I taught school in Atlanta for a while. And then I went off to graduate school at Syracuse University, where thanks to the GI Bill, numerous scholarships, and lots of different part-time jobs, including being a department store Santa Claus at Riches in Atlanta, uh, I actually uh, graduated with these degrees. And finally, I figured I had enough education and better start looking for jobs. Um, now, at Syracuse, I resumed my research on learning. My dissertation focused on explaining the differential success that high school students had in completing college level courses that were offered by Syracuse University by something called Project Advance. Project Advance used printed materials using the Keller plan or their personalized system of instruction. These were print modules that students in high school studied at their own pace. And they could decide when they wanted to take tests, but they had to pass those tests at a 90% level or better before they could go on to the next module in the course. And Project Advance offered nine different undergraduate courses, and students earned regular Syracuse University transcripts that they could transfer just about anywhere in the world. But there was uh, the, the interesting thing was, I think, that they could take tests at any time they felt like they wanted, but they had to pass it at a very high level. They had courses in subjects like biology, calculus, economics, and so forth. Actually, Project Advance continues to this day. They recently celebrated their 40th anniversary, and they still offer courses now on three different continents. Now, last year, uh, my most recent book I co-edited with some colleagues is called uh, MOOCs and Open Education Around the World. Uh, MOOCs stands for Massive Open Online Courses. MOOCs actually enroll tens of thousands of students in a single MOOC. And there are several MOOCs that actually have exceeded enrollment of one million since they were first offered. Interestingly, more people have taken MOOCs that were developed at Harvard in a single year than took courses at Harvard in their entire 377 year history. These MOOCs are often offered by elite universities such as Stanford, MIT, and Harvard through enterprises such as Coursera, uh, FutureLearn, and edX. Some folks here at the University of Georgia are involved in this as well. Um, and I've taught several MOOCs and, and have been a student in, in many others, and I really recommend them to you. But if you know anything about MOOCs, they're very controversial. Uh, a lot of people criticize them for their high attrition rates. They often have uh, attrition rates of 90% or more, and other people say they really don't have a long-term viable financial model. Uh, those of us who are proponents of these massive open online courses say that uh, they provide an opportunity for students who wouldn't otherwise have the opportunity for higher education. And by the way, they also provide a wonderful laboratory for experimenting with alternative ways of teaching. Unfortunately, my analysis of most MOOCs finds out that has found out that they're really not any better than those print materials that were developed at Project Advance back in the 1970s. In fact, in some ways, they're worse. Uh, particularly with respect to uh, learning and attrition. Uh, and I think it was, again, going back to that requirement that you pass uh, at a 90% level before you go on in the course. Now, uh, MOOCs are guilty of what I call the three T's. They're dominated by teacher talk, text, and test, usually in the form of brief videos and a lecture. Uh, they have short readings, and they also have online quizzes. Now, it turns out that many traditional courses around the world, and frankly here at our university as well, are also dominated by these three T's. They're dominated in terms of teacher talk in the form of lectures, uh, text in the form of textbooks and other readings, uh, test in the form of exams or perhaps term papers. Uh, it's interesting because MOOC critics 
criticize massive open online courses because of what they see is a weak instructional design, but they fail to turn that same critical lens on traditional courses on campus, which if we're really honest with ourselves, we know very little about their effectiveness and their outcomes. Right now, I'd like to talk a little bit about learning theory. Um, you know, the project advanced materials were based on a behavioral theory that dominated when I was in graduate school. But since then, there have been many learning theories developed. A cognitivist, humanist, constructivist, constructionist, social and connectivist. Uh, we don't have time to go into what all these learning theories mean, but unfortunately, the lessons from these learning theories don't seem to be filtering down into a lot of our higher education initiatives. But one of the most important advances in cognitive science is that we now realize that knowledge is not just the collection of facts and long-term memory, but a spectrum of internal mental states, ranging from simple propositions, for example, that China sells more manufactured goods than any other country in the world, through schema, rules, general rules, skills, general skills, automatic skills, and finally, the highest mental state, mental models. A mental model be, might be something like uh, it, interpreting the re economic relationship between China and the United States as a form of economic symbiosis. The higher mental models turn out to be really important because they form the basis for creativity and problem solving. Now, unfortunately, I think the reason that so many of our courses, both MOOCs and traditional courses, uh, are dominated by the traditional methods is that many, too many of us have a mental model of learning is what I call the filing cabinet mental model. We just view uh, the brain as something we can stuff more and more memory into. Even though the last 30 years has represented so many advances in cognitive science and learning sciences, again, uh, many of us teach and learn as if knowledge was simply a matter of enabling changes in long-term memory. Now, with that background in learning, let me turn to the topic of robots and deep learning. I was born in 1947, and I grew up in the 1950s when there really were two different images of robots. One image of robots were these friendly robots. Here we see a couple of robots uh, actually helping to put up the Christmas tree. This is from cover story of the 1958 issue of Popular Electronics. We were excited by that possibility. Uh, others were more horrifying. We had lots of sci-fi magazines and movies like The Day the Earth Stood Still that portrayed robots as something that were going to try to attack human beings. Of course, it turned out, as in so many things, that real-world robots did not look like science fiction robots. In 1980, this was a cover story in Time magazine, when they talked about the robot revolution, and they were primarily talking about robotic arms and other mechanisms that automated assembly lines, like in the automotive industry. Now, just last year, Time magazine had another cover where they talked about the singularity and suggested that we might reach the singularity by the year 2045. The singularity has many different interpretations. But primarily, it represents the time when machine learning and, and artificial intelligence will reach the point where it will actually exceed human learning, and that there'll be some sort of either dystopian or utopian outcome. On the dystopian side, it might be that these artificial intelligent algorithms and robots wake up to the fact that, hey, we really don't need these humans anymore. Let's eliminate them. Or maybe they could just subsume us into their system and we wouldn't even know. Uh, and then other people talk about an utopian outcome where we would actually merge our intelligence with these deep learning systems and achieve some sort of digital immortality. Some people have been so concerned about this uh, that they actually have called for a halt to research in machine learning, thinking that the dystopian outcomes are the most likely type of outcome. Now, most AI researchers dismiss this possibility, uh, but uh, the history of AI research goes back to the year 1956, when uh, John McCarthy and a, another group of scientists actually uh, began research 
in the area of trying to make computers mimic human intelligence. John McCarthy was at MIT, and he coined the term artificial intelligence. By the way, his partner in starting that laboratory, Marvin Minsky, just passed away at age 88 this weekend. He was another great uh, pioneer in this whole area. They were primarily focused on building machines that mimic or replicated human intelligence. And one of their proofs that they were going to achieve were they were going to build computers that could beat human chess masters. But they didn't have very much success for many years, uh, mainly because of the limits of tech, uh, computer power and programming at the time. It really wasn't until 1997 that the Big Blue program from IBM successfully beat then world champion Gary Gasparov in chess. And these and many other advances were realized only after AI researchers largely abandoned the search to replicate human intelligence, but were trying other types of strategies. Now, deep learning is the current buzzword for this whole area. Researchers in this area today are focused on building systems that can perform numerous tasks that previously reserved for humans. These systems are developing an amazing capacity to see and understand, to listen and speak, to read and write, and to get, integrate information and make judgments. And these are developing at amazing rates. Most of us are comfortable with the idea of robotics taking over manufacturing jobs, but we've not begun to grapple with what machine learning advances mean for the professions. Now, uh, consider pharmacy. We have a great college of pharmacy here at the University of Georgia. But according to Martin Ford, he's a computer scientist and entrepreneur who wrote the book Rise of the Robots, Technology and the Threat of a Jobless Future. Uh, he describes how these systems are taking over many of the routine tasks of pharmacists. For example, the University of California Medical Center in San Francisco issues 10,000 individual medications to its patients per day, 10,000 medications, without a human pharmacist ever touching a pill or a medicine bottle. How do they accomplish this? Well, they have these algorithms and automated systems, including robots, you see one here, that store, dispense, package, and deliver the medications directly to each patient's bedside so that with barcodes and the patient is scanned, the medicine's scanned, it's greatly reduced human error. Uh, this picture shows one of these robot components, and I, I probably can't read it, but the sign on there says, please do not enter the elevator with the robot. Not, not sure what that's all about. Now, you think, well, uh, so much for the pharmacist. Well, uh, the uh, other professions are threatened as well. This is an interesting book uh, that was written by two authors from the UK. It's called The Future of the Professions, How Technology Will Transform the Work of Human Experts. Father and son authors, Richard and Daniel Suskin. Now, these are not computer scientists. Uh, Richard Suskin is one of the foremost barristers in the uh, equivalent of the Supreme Court in the United Kingdom. His son is an economics lecturer at Oxford. And they basically describe how these automated deep learning systems are taking over tasks reserved for physicians, accountants, architects, lawyers, journalists, and teachers, among other professions. Uh, they predict the dismantling of the professions as we know them, and incidentally, that means also as we, how we teach them. Now, I couldn't begin to explain how these deep uh, learning algorithms work, and we wouldn't have time for me to do that. But here's a scary thought. Jeremy, uh, Jerry Kaplan wrote in his book, Humans Need Not Apply, A Guide to Wealth and Work in the Age of Artificial Intelligence. He's a futurist and a very successful entrepreneur. He wrote, in most cases, it's impossible for the creators of machine learning programs to peer into their intricate, evolving structure 
to understand or explain what they know or how they solve a problem, any more than I can look into your brain and understand what you're thinking about. So even the computer scientists don't really understand completely how these systems are working. Now, in the remaining time I have, let's, let's uh, engage in a little thought experiment. Let's set aside the possibility that computers will realize uh, artificial general intelligence and it will reach the singularity as some have predicted, including, by the way, Stephen Hawking says we're going to reach the singularity even sooner than 2025. Uh, but let's put that aside and let's just suppose that these deep learning artificial intelligence programs continue to advance, resulting in the elimination of many of the careers our students are currently pursuing. Consider journalism, for example. We have one of the world's best journalism school here, uh, schools here at the University of Georgia. Uh, but the need for journalists and technical writers and corporations is already being eliminated by these deep learning systems. They have these algorithms that corporations, instead of hiring technical writers and journalisms, they have these algorithms today that can go out and write their annual reports. They go out and they go search all the internal documents and latest information on the web and they generate the annual reports for these corporations. There's an AI program called Quill that was developed at Northwestern University. It's marketed by a company called Narrative Science. And magazines like Forbes and Wired are using these programs. They can generate a new story in 30 seconds. Wired Magazine predicts that 90% of all journalism stories, all news stories, will be written by these algorithms within a few years. So who is going to hire our graduates in journalism? Well, they can't all work for Starbucks. Um, you know, in the past, when our uh, jobs have been eliminated by technology or jobs have been shipped overseas, our nation has doubled down on further education and training to prepare people for new careers. But what if there are few alternative careers? leaving large percentages of college graduates unemployed or underemployed? What if the fundamental assumption that the more education you have, the better off your financial circumstances will be, is undermined in the future, as some economists are predicting? Atlantic Magazine speculates in this article called Can Starbucks Save the Middle Class? In a post-work society, the financial rewards of education education and training won't be as obvious. Now, some countries are looking at this problem and they're actually experimenting with the notion of a guaranteed basic income. For example, in the Netherlands, these posters are plastered all over London now calling for a guaranteed basic income. You might think, well, that'll never fly in the United States. But actually, there are proponents of this on both the right and the left obviously for different rationales. Uh, but how will we prepare our students to live in such a world? We have to address this question in a more serious and coordinated effort. For one thing, we can change how we deal with the learning domains. Uh, teachers and many university faculty are taught about three learning domains. The cognitive domain or knowledge domain, the affective or feeling domain, and the uh, psychomotor or skill, physical skills domain. For actually every teacher is introduced in the College of Education is introduced uh, to the revised cognitive domain illustrated here that includes cognitive skills related to remembering, um, and uh, I just spilled some water on my computer, hopefully it won't die here. <laughs> um, and uh, so we've got remembering, under, understanding, applying, uh, and analyzing, evaluating, and creating. Now, obviously, the higher end of this uh, hierarchy is more important uh, than the lower end of this taxonomy. But unfortunately, my analysis shows that all too often, we just teach to the lower half. Uh, and that's because it's easier to teach and it's easier to test. Uh, whereas, arguably, the higher order is much more important for our graduates today. Um, 
But the real shame is that we've eliminated an entire domain from most of our uh, work in higher education, and that's the cognitive domain. The cognitive domain, again, is about knowledge, the affective domain with values and feelings, the psychomotor with physical skills, and the cognitive domain with will. It's clear that individuals may graduate from our university with the cognitive capacity, the affective values, and the physical skills to perform in a given job or career, but whether they possess the will, the drive, the energy, the level of effort, the mental uh, focus, the intention, the striving, and the self-determination to actually perform at that task is often unknown. Consider voting. This is a major civic responsibility. In the 2014 uh, uh, midterm elections, 59% of people in my generation, age 65 or older, voted. Only 23% of people between the ages of 34, excuse me, 18 and 34 voted. Now these young people, I know they have the knowledge to vote. Uh, certainly they hopefully care about the results of the election. There aren't many physical skills involved in, in uh, voting but they just don't have the cognitive drive to follow through and vote. But it's not just young people. Consider physicians. The Centers for Disease Control reports that there are 700,000 Americans who get uh, medically induced infections in hospitals per, per year. Can't attribute all of these to physicians, but 75,000 people with these infections actually die in hospitals. Now, research has shown that Nurses are much better at following through on disinfecting their hands as they go from patient to patient than physicians. Studies have shown that many physicians report compliance at 90%, but when nurses actually track their performance, it's under 10%. Again, they have the knowledge, they have the values, they have the psychomotor skills, they just don't follow through and do it. Interestingly, this sense of the cognitive domain has been around since Aristotle. Aristotle used the term orexis, striving, desire, the cognitive aspect of mind. And he used the analogy of a Greek charioteer. He said a successful charioteer needed to have a great driver, that's the cognitive capacity, to steer the chariot in two powerful steeds, the affect of desire to win and the cognitive drive to actually accomplish victory in the race. It's the difference between knowing, caring, and doing. Now, maybe you haven't heard of the cognitive domain, but certainly you probably have heard of grit. MacArthur Genius Awardee and University of Pennsylvania psychology professor Angela Lee Duckworth has developed measures of this construct she calls grit. And has found that measures of grit predict academic success better than many other variables, including SAT scores and high school rank it's defined as the perseverance and passion for a long-term goal. Grit is a strong predictor of the accomplishment of higher achievers in many fields, and interestingly, it does not correlate with IQ. Now, in a world of diminished career and work opportunities, grit and the cognitive domain are going to be more important than ever. So we need to ask ourselves, how can we address the cognitive domain in our courses and programs? Can our students learn to exhibit the necessary high levels of grit as they struggle to survive in a time where predictable career, career paths will no, be few and far between? I think the University of Georgia's experiential learning requirement that's going to go into effect this coming fall is a great step in the right direction, but we must do more. Now, another book in this whole field uh, is a book written by two MIT professors from the Sloan School of Management. And uh, their book is called The Second Machine Age. And they predict that there are three educational outcomes that robots and deep learning machines cannot accomplish in the foreseeable future. Specifically, their ideation, broad frame pattern recognition, and complex communication. Ideation concerns creativity, the much-vaunted thinking outside of the box. 
broad frame pattern recognition involves taking input from multiple senses and examining the whole picture, uh, including social, political, economic, cultural, and technical factors to find a solution for ill-structured problems. Complex communication requires the integration of verbal and nonverbal communication and nuance with empathy to make convincing arguments and persuade others. So these are things that in the foreseeable future they think that these algorithms will not be able to accomplish. In their book, though, they go on to lament the fact that studies show that today's undergraduates are not achieving these outcomes. And that's primarily, they argue, because they're spending much less time studying than ever before in courses taught by professors who demand very little from them in terms of reading and writing. Interestingly, they cite other studies that show the students who show major improvements in these critical outcomes of ideation, pattern recognition, and complete complex communication are exactly those who spend more time studying, taking courses that require more reading and writing, and have more demanding faculty. Now, we have some MEGS award winners. That's our highest teaching award. I know the, our esteemed president has won that award. I have, um, I bet that if we looked at the uh, background of our very best teachers, we would find that high expectations is a signature characteristic. And I also know the students who are here in this audience today are exactly the type of learners who expect and appreciate high demands. But we have to work together to expand the provision of rigorous learning opportunities for all of our students. We in the faculty, we can't do it all. Students have to meet us halfway. So I call upon our university leaders, our faculty, our staff, our students to critically examine what we're doing here at the University of Georgia, our programs and our courses that assume that all secure careers await our graduates. That world is coming to an end. Instead, universities have to prepare our graduates to survive in a rapidly changing world, one in which people with the kind of lifelong careers of today may only be seen in museum exhibits. Now, in his last State of the Union address two weeks ago, President Obama ended his address by asking some big questions. And interestingly, one of the last ones was how to make, how can we make new technology work for more people, not against people? He even joked that the only Americans who can expect a 30-year career with full benefits were the senators and representatives in the room. Now, no offense to President Obama, but most tenure-track faculty have that expectation as well. But um, I want you to ask yourself, you know, the title of my talk was, do you, So You Think You're Smarter Than a Robot. Do you? We might each ask ourselves, what fundamental breakthrough, unexpected today in machine intelligence, would sig significantly transform our area of specialization, how we conduct research, or whether we even have a job anymore. Now, I know that I've asked a lot of questions today and not provided many answers, so I implore you to heed the words of the philosopher Voltaire, who said, judge a man by his questions rather than his answers. <laughs> Perhaps a few years from now, someone reading this lecture or viewing the video online will be able to say, you know that Reeves guy, he was like the boy who cried robot. And unlike the proverbial wolf, the robot never came. Perhaps so. But I'll leave you with another quote from Voltaire. Everything is fine today. That is our illusion. Thank you. Thank you for those remarks. I'd now like to introduce our student responder, Brian Heredia.
Brian is a sophomore history and social studies education double major from Athens. He is a UGA honor student and an ambassador for the College of Education. He has worked on campus since 2014 and recently began training as a UGA bus driver. In his free time, Brian volunteers as an after-school tutor. Following graduation, Brian plans to share his passion for history and education with high school students in Georgia. Please help me welcome Brian Heredia to the podium. So, um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, unfortunately, I feel that um, we're gonna run over 2.30, so if you do have to bow out, um, um, I'm not offended if you do while I talk. <laughs> First of all, I want to start off by um, just thanking the people that helped me get to where I am today. Um, I want to thank Dr. Reeves here for um, just extending this opportunity to me to speak to you today. I never thought that I'd ever speak in the chapel, much less as an undergraduate here at UGA. I um, also want to thank Abraham Baldwin and the Georgia General Assembly. If they hadn't acted on this day in 1785, um, the University of Georgia would have never been the first chartered public institution, institution for higher education in the country. Um, and we also wouldn't be celebrating UGA's 231st birthday today. Um, I also want to thank um, Dr. Paul Quick um, in the Center of Teaching and Learning for um, the experience that I had in his class and for um, providing support today. Also, I need to thank the Office of College Advancement and the Office of Student Services in the College of Education and the staff and alumni relations that helped make this day possible. And last but not least, I want to thank my family members for being here today. I'm grateful to have your support while I pursue my education here at Georgia. Um, today, I hope to respond to some of the issues that Professor Reeves mentioned in his lecture. I can't tell you, honestly, that robots aren't gonna take over the world. But um, as one of the lead leading institutions for higher education in this country, I believe that Georgia should play a role at being a leader in developing students for whatever the future may hold. Um, to start off, I wanna share my story about why I chose to be a bulldog. I've lived my life my whole life so far here in the Athens area. However, despite that, I really didn't know much about what the University of Georgia had to offer. Um, I am a first generation college student and I grew up in a working class family. Um, before my junior year at Cedar Shoals High School here in Athens, I had been on campus twice. Once in elementary school for a Lady Dogs basketball game and then again in eighth grade to visit the Village Summit Dining Commons. Based on the two trays of food I ate that day, I can tell you that UGA was and is a special place. Uh, however, the teachers at Cedar Shoals were the ones who exposed me to the value that the university offers to students. Thanks to them, UGA became the only school I seriously considered for college. Honestly, I'm glad that worked out. Um, now, my passion academically has always been in history. I see history as more than just facts and dates. History, to me, conveys the story of the amazing and everyday experiences that shape and define societies. Um, decisions made by members of societies hundreds and thousands of years ago um, still influence decisions made today. For example, World War I occurred from 1914 to 1918. Honestly, you could just simply leave it at that. But there's more than just those dates. Um, I personally like looking at the reasons and the motivating factors why major events in history occurred. Um, for example, for World War I, Britain and France hoped that um, World War I would be, quote, the war to end all wars. However, decisions made after the war, such as the Treaty of Versailles and the Balfour Declaration, would contribute to the emergence of regimes 
such as the Third Reich in Germany, and contribute to the unrest we see in the Israeli region today. Um, as a future educator, I hope that I can help students uh, make connections with how historical decisions like these affect the present and the future. However, unfortunately, most classrooms in K-12 and in higher education do not go beyond basic comprehension. Teachers rely on lectures and worksheets in order to highlight what is necessary for a test of some sort. Um, this, unfortunately, is the reality as many funds are tied to um, the academic performance of students. Now, I don't view that that promotes learning at its highest level. Um, on, unfortunately, it's very easy to do, especially if you have classrooms that have, um, that have sizes close to 300 people. In that size, you cannot get personal with your students, and you have to rely on those basic comprehension skills in order to realize if students grasp material. But however, um, the learning experiences that I've valued the most while I've been here at Georgia are the ones that make me to take that make me want to take action with the material that is being taught. These classes have been small enough to where the instruction of class is personalized. For me, one of these classes was English 2340, um, a comparative American literature post-Civil War with Dr. Quick. Um, with just 23 students in the class, he was able to help us look at historical contexts of each work and then help us, help us analyze how these historical aspects could have affected the writing. Um, and with that, it was easier to come up with ideas about how writers such as Alice Walker and Walt Whitman um, were influenced in their work. Um, he helped us care about knowledge and to actually apply it. The experience that Dr. Quick provided to my class is one that I hope that every student can have here at the University of Georgia. And a great step that the university has taken to enrich student experiences university-wide is the experiential learning requirement that will take effect this coming fall. Experiential learning will require students to pursue opportunities such as research, internships, service learning, and study abroad in order to, quote, learn by doing. All students, I view, would benefit from the ability to have experiences in their field of interest. Um, for example, in the College of Education, excuse me, requirements like these are already in place. Um, teacher prep majors have three foundation courses that they must take before they apply to their major. Um, in these classes, their students are required to take at least 10 hours outside in the community of a field experience. And for me, this led to my involvement with the student organization, Whatever It Takes, at the Rock Springs Community Center here in Athens. This past fall, I served as a head tutor there and I was able to share strategies and concepts that I learned from my education to the other tutors. Overall, this experience has allowed me to grow as a leader and as an educator. And thanks to whatever it takes, I know that education is the field that I want to pursue. And luckily for us students, the University of Georgia has invested significant resources towards these sorts of experiential learning experiences. It's very visible by our presence in facilities across the world, such as the ones in Oxford, Cortona, um, Costa Rica, and in Washington, D.C. Um, these extensions of the university outside of our state increase our visibility to people across the globe, and in this increasingly competitive world, I view that this outreach is a great way to expose people around the world to the work and the people that make the University of Georgia one of the best institutions for higher education in this country. However, we also must continue work to work on developing partnerships with businesses, especially here in Georgia. We must work with our businesses, large and small, in order to provide students with opportunities such as internships and apprenticeships. 
if students are able to work with companies in their field early on, they can see firsthand how companies are planning for the present and the future. These opportunities are essential for students seeking to evolve as the work environment changes, especially if the predictions that deep learning theorists have made do become reality. A factor that places the University of Georgia at the forefront of higher education today is its value. Despite the value that UGA offers today, um, our administrators, I believe, should continue to find ways to fund educational opportunities for our students without passing the burden onto them. Um, this past year, full-time tuition rose 9% from $8,590 last school year to $9,364 this school year. If this current rate increase stays in place for another five years, tuition would be at $13,218 for the 2019-2020 school year. That's an average increase close to $1,000 each year. This figure also does not include possible rate increases for room, board, and other fees. These increased costs, I believe, could lead to a situation in which an educationally qualified student may avoid Georgia simply because of money. I really hope that we don't allow that to happen. I view, um, personally, going along with um, one of the points Dr. Rees made, I view that online education can play a role in providing that affordable, accessible education. Currently, our own College of Education is a leader in providing online courses for teachers and other educational professionals um, who have less time they can devote to, to higher education due to their jobs. It allows them to still access the resources of a major research university without physically being there. Well-designed online courses can help people in many fields develop skills that will make them more competitive in an increasingly global workforce. Online learning can also help the university serve populations it would otherwise be unable to reach. However, I view this technology as a resource for those who cannot access the university physically and not as a replacement to the val valuable sensory experiences that peers and teachers have in the classroom. Now, the biggest question that Dr. Reeves posed today is, how can we better prepare our students to succeed in an unpredictable future? This will require a closer examination of what our society values now and what it will value in the future. To what extent will we allow robots and deep learning machines to do our work? What will our future society value with respect to the uniqueness of human learning and human experiences? Recently, a development that has caught my interest is the development of autonomous vehicles. Yes, there are great benefits to this technology. Crashes will be reduced as people who are already texting instead of driving would not be directly involved. However, what would this technology mean for industries such as public transit? Um, a week ago today, actually, I began training with UGA Campus Transit in order to become a bus driver on campus. Before I was hired, I had to study a lot in order to pass the federally mandated instructional permit test. Now, I will spend at least two months learning about the buses in our fleet and about the challenges that the largest university transit system in the country faces daily. Today, people demand well-trained, qualified drivers. However, if a successful production of an autonomous bus occurs, my job would be eliminated. Without my job, I would struggle to pay for basic living expenses and would force, be forced to make sacrifices in order to continue my education here. Um, this need is also why I worked at the Village Summit for a year and a half before I moved to transit. Um, both of these jobs, I view, allowed me to help acquire skills in different trades other than education and give me a backup in case something does go wrong. I view um, these student employment opportunities as a great way for students to learn new skills and to make a student more marketable in a more unpredictable workforce. I hope that our university can continue our commitment to student employment in the future.
Now, I've shared with you a lot about my experiences and how I feel these can affect students in the future. But now, I want to leave you with some questions. Sorry about that. Um, I think that it's very important for us together, everyone in this room or anybody viewing online, that we think about these three questions that I'm going to pose since we do have to think about what will happen in the future. Um, first of all, what knowledge, skills, attitudes, what, sorry, what knowledge, skills, and attitudes will our students require in order to thrive in a future where technology may reduce the need for work or careers as we know them today? Secondly, how can students, faculty, and staff in both higher education and K-12 work together in order to enhance human experiences and personal learning in the curriculum? And finally, how can the University of Georgia continue to promote higher education as a public force for good, not just for Georgians, but also for the rest of the world? Thank you. Thank you, Brian, for that response and for illustrating the quality of students who are enrolled at UGA. And thank you to Dr. Reeves for his thoughtful remarks. As a thank you for joining us today, I'd like to present our distinguished speakers with gifts on behalf of the UGA Alumni Association. Dr. Reeves, we've placed a book in your honor, Digital Technology and the Contemporary University, Degrees of Digitization in Your Name in the UGA Library. And Brian, what student doesn't enjoy a slew of spirited UGA gear? Please enjoy this basket of UGA Alumni Association goodies. <laughs> Today's lecture is a part of a week-long series of events to celebrate UGA's 231st 231st birthday. Not only is the Student Alumni Council hosting events on campus for students throughout the week, but the university has invited alumni around the world to show their love on social media using hashtag HBDUGA. And the celebration continues immediately following today's lecture as there will be a reception in honor of Dr. Reeves in the Russell Special Collections Libraries building that will be in just a few minutes. And I hope all of you are able to join us. Please ask a student or staff volunteer for directions before you leave. The UGA Charter is on display today and tomorrow and will be available for viewing during the gathering. Thank you for joining us today and for your support of the University of Georgia. We look forward to seeing you next January as we celebrate 232 years. I'd like to ask our speakers to remain on stage and to the rest of you, have a wonderful afternoon. <laughs>